Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be discussing compounds for endurance. So this topic has been extensively talked about when it comes to a lot of performance athletes like bicyclists and marathon runners and everything under the sun, <laughs> really, when it comes down to it as far as endurance sports go. Um, it uh, is a controversial topic. There are things like blood doping where you take out your red blood cells so that your body replenishes your red blood cells and then they give you your red blood cells back so now you have more oxygen carrying capacity. There's um, uh, injecting uh, EPO, there's carterine, and there's other drugs. But let's uh, say the disclaimer before we get into this. I am not a doctor, and I am not a chemist. I'm just some dude on the internet who likes to talk about this stuff and learn about it. Uh, and I'm specifically not your doctor. I do not encourage the use of any substances or anything legal or illegal, and this video is strictly for educational and entertainment purposes only. So when it comes to carterine, um, this is one that people confuse of SARMs a lot. It is not a SARM, um, nor was there ever a drug called carterine that was a SARM. The only reason that it gets so confused with it is because people on the same websites that sell SARMs were selling this drug. And it is a drug, and it is a very powerful drug. It has some potential to cause cancer. Uh, we don't fully comprehend the extent of it. However, we have done, um, it, they kind of scrapped a lot of the progress on uh, carterine last I knew. I think they picked it back up though because of a lot of the mice that they were giving this drug to had side effects. Now, they gave it to them for three years straight. And if you can imagine one day for us is one, or sorry, one month uh, for us is one day for the rat because it doesn't live very long mice or rat. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but the thing is they had them on a, n not really bolus dose, but a high enough dose for a long period of time. I think it was three years straight. Most of them developed cancers. So it's possible that this drug could be used in moderation and not cause cancers. However, you have to be careful. Um, Carterine is also called GW or GW5015516. Um, I may have gotten the number wrong. Sorry, I was doing this off. I was writing that down off the top of my memory. Um, again, it's often sold with SARMs. It is not a SARM. It is not selective to the androgen receptor. And it's not. it, it has nothing to do with the androgen receptor in general, to my understanding. It allows your body to increase endurance. It has some potential for lowering bad cholesterol, increasing good cholesterol, uh, obviously, like I said, helping with cardiovascular endurance. I think it has some effect on upregulating, excuse me, upregulating white uh, red blood cell count, as well as there seems to be some potential for it to turn um, fast twitch muscle fibers into slow twitch muscle fibers, basically making it so you become less of a sprinter bodybuilder type and more of a long distance runner, cross country skiing type. Um, it also seems to be helpful when it comes to some metabolic issues and some health issues in that regard. And there is a good amount of evidence to support that it helps with blood sugar control. So people who have elevated blood sugars, it's like they like to say, it's like exercise in a bottle. It's like um, if you could go on multiple walks every single day, that's what this would do for you theoretically. Now, it seems to have a lot of those effects in humans. Uh, granted, when people take them and stack them with other drugs like they commonly do, when they stack carterine with S23, their cholesterol doesn't change uh, or might even still continue to get worse and skew, partially just because of that. To be clear, when I talk about cholesterols, I understand that HDL and LDL are not actually cholesterols. They are the components that move cholesterols, to my understanding, around the body, but I digress. Um, so when it comes to uh, EPO, erythropoietin, um, I may have said that wrong. I apologize if I did. This is a drug that um, is at least similar chemically. I believe it's bioidentical in the body to our own endogenous EPO. Now, what does EPO do? It drives the upregulation of our body to produce more red blood cells. So if you take EPO, your body's going to go, oh, Okay, well, I, I need to start producing more red blood cells. A lot of fighters have been caught with it. A lot of, you know, um, uh, bicyclists, uh, 
skiers, like it, it's it's all over the map. Uh, runners. Um, so when it comes to EPO, part of the problem is if you get a bioidentical type and you don't have a uh, what do you call it? Uh, biological passport. It's hard to pick up on um, because if it is bioidentical, you may just have an elevated EPO level compared to your competitors. Also, I don't believe it lasts in the system very long. So you can upregulate your red blood cells, then you're good to go. Um, it has a lot of problems. Um, Carterine has cancer and this one has blood clots. So when you upregulate the amount of red blood cells in your body, you are very likely to get a blood clot because that is part of the clotting factors, how thick your blood is. Imagine you're making your blood more viscous, more dense. It's not, it's not necessarily a positive thing. The only reason it's positive for these athletes is because they're burning through so much oxygen. The more oxygen carry capacity they can have is better for them. So EPO, um, it, it's the, uh, I believe it's injectable. Um, like I said, a lot of major athletes have used it. Kind of hard to catch, kind of not. Depends on what form they're using, to my understanding, and how they're using it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Overall, um, EPO is very dangerous. Um, I mean, for gosh sakes, the thing I'm about to talk about next, people actively donate blood so that they don't get too viscous of blood. So the last one I'm going to talk about is pretty much any anabolic steroid. Um, the major ones for knowing to increase blood viscosity are test, nandrolone, and equipoise. Testosterone, nandrolone, and um, boldenone. Uh, nandrolone is also called decadurabolin. It was a brand name back in the day. Nandrolone is the actual chemical name. So um, all... Those three in particular, and especially in combination, have been known to drastically increase red blood cell count in the body, making your blood very, very viscous. Um, a lot of bodybuilders were very nervous when a certain disease that I'm not going to name uh, started going around the country, uh, around the world, because they noticed that a lot of the people who got this disease were getting blood clots. So a lot of bodybuilders freaked out, started donating blood, making sure they had very loose blood because they didn't want clotting factors. And the thing is, you can also go too far in donating blood and become, um, I can't remember the term for it, but you, you can have too low of an oxygen carrying capacity. <clears throat> and so pretty much the last category is um, uh, any anabolic steroid that increases blood viscosity, which can be pretty much any of them. I think even a lot of SARMs increase blood viscosity. I'm not going to quote, uh, don't quote me on that. I'm not entirely certain, but I mean, it, you just think about all the things that raise your blood pressure. Um, I know that blood pressure and viscosity are not always interplay or related. In fact, they're frequently not interplay related. But if you can think about how many drugs raise your blood pressure as far as steroids go, you can think about how many <laughs> how many of these uh, drugs increase blood viscosity because the fact of the matter is almost all of them do. Um, I don't think there's any that are... I mean, Anavar at a therapeutic dosage, probably not. And it, if it does, it's probably not too dramatic. Um, so... Some are obviously worse than others. The big three that I just mentioned are typically the worst. One that's also really bad, uh, which is just a bad drug in general, in my opinion, is trendalone. Um, neurotoxicity, night sweats. I mean, I can I can go on on the list of why I do not like trendalone. Um, but um, people who take these compounds, uh, who are bodybuilders and such, they want to stay healthy, so they donate blood so that their blood is thinner. Um, nothing wrong with donating blood. Oftentimes when you donate blood and you know you're healthy, you're just giving blood to somebody who needs it and you have a lot of viscosity, you're probably helping them out. Um, but that's if you're prescribed it. I'm not talking about if you're not prescribed these drugs. And on top of that, um, going back to EPO. So these people who are on just steroids are donating blood because of how thick the blood is. Can you imagine injecting Sin, uh, uh, like erythropoietin into your body exogenously so that your body upregulates the process of making red blood cells even more while you're training increasing your red blood cell count dramatically i mean it's just it's wild uh the, the same concepts for these things uh, as far as the blood viscosity um also relate to people who go into the mountains and ride uh, in the mountains or bike or sorry, ride their bike or run or even just live in the mountains or use the chambers 
that help them to increase blood viscosity. I can't remember what the pressure chambers, I think they are. Um, <clears throat> and the thing is, they're all under the same concept. Uh, but the pressure chambers and the living at high altitudes, completely okay for sports. GW, EPO, and obviously anabolic steroids, not okay. Um, I think it's the idea of one is more so training and using techniques, and the other is a synthetic drug that you can just take. Now, when it comes to EPO, there is one caveat I'm going to say. Um, the logic behind a lot of these increasings of blood viscosity is for people who are burning through so flipping much oxygen that they need it, or, or like practically need it. They've actually shown, uh, to my understanding, it could be wrong, correct me on this if I am, that in the Tour de France, it is so grueling and so bad for the body. They proved that people who are on performance-enhancing drugs in the Tour de France actually end up healthier at the end of the race than people who aren't because they simply can't recover to the rate that people who aren't on the drugs simply can't recover to the rate that people who are on drugs can. And I'm, I'm referring to things like EPO, things like the uh, anabolics and things like carterine. And to me, that just shows how insane that race is, if I'm being completely honest with you, that it, it's, it's, it, it blows my mind that that's even a concept that that bike race is a real thing. But overall, I mean, that's kind of the concept behind using those drugs in a performance enhancing context. A lot of like bodybuilders try to use like EPO and stuff. And that's just ludicrous. You don't, those dudes aren't doing cardio intensive workouts a lot of the time. Um, and I mean, even if they are, they're not to the level that people in the tour de France are. So that, that concept's silly on me. And it's not lost on me that when I talk about this, there are certain situations where it seems like it makes sense. Certain situations where it's so far off the radar, like why would you do that? Like the guy going to the gym every other week, taking EPO, like that's a horrible idea. You're asking for a blood clot. But overall, um, that is my analysis of the different uh, compounds that I know to improve endurance. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please give this video a thumbs up. Uh, subscribe to my channel. Turn on that little notification bell that's right above it. Uh, and as always, uh, keep those shoulders back and down when you lift and don't just have a good one. Have a great one.